This morning, uh, we're going to be talking about Hail Mary compassionate use uh, cases. This is a symposium, and Faraz is going to kick it off for us uh, with a keynote, Success uh, in the Compassionate Use Pathway. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Good morning, everybody. I think uh, this is the... You guys are the most adventurous part of the meeting. We showed up at uh, 8.30 in the morning on the last day, so I really, really thank you, and uh, hopefully we can add to the success of this meeting with this uh, morning session. It's my disclosure. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about compassion use. I'm not, it's not to uh, you know, show cases. All my colleagues uh, after following me are gonna showing up cases, but I wanna go through the process of what is compassion use, what is expanded, uh, use and how to go about it if you if you think about or if you have a patient who might benefit from compassionate use case. So I'm going to start by expanded access. Expanded access allow the use of unapproved investigational drug or device. So point number one, the device is that you're thinking about for expanded access is not FDA approved. And you want to treat a patient and it's usually a patient not a group of patients. You cannot say, well, I have a device that I want to treat tricuspid regurgitation and I have 100 patients in my hospital. That is not expanded use. And the patient that cannot have a comparable alternative therapy. You cannot say, well, you know what, those patients can be treated with mitroclip that is commercially approved, but I believe that device X is better and I want to treat those patients with, with device X. And finally, you have to have exhausted all options to treat this disease or condition before you think about an expanded use. It cannot be your first option. So the intent here is to treat the patient. It's a treatment plan, you, and it's not research. And you, as physician who are thinking about compassionate use, you are not an investigator in that capacity. You are a treating physician. Those are subtle but yet very important distinction if you think about doing compassionate use on your patients. So what do you have, what do you have to, what do you, what do you need if you want to go with a compassionate use for your patient? What are the things that are prerequisite before? So the patient has to have a life-threatening or serious disease or condition. You cannot say, well, you know, I've seen Mr. Smith who had mild TR and I'm seeing him for a pre-op for mole removal and I think that this patient needs his tricuspid replaced, therefore I'm going to put them for a compassionate use. That is not going to work. It has to be a life-threatening, serious condition that there is no comparable satisfactory or alternative therapy for those patients. And you have to prove and show in your FDA IRB submission that the benefit outweigh the risk. You have to have a, an understanding, whether from what was previously published, literature, prior experience, whatever, that you have to have a reasonable uh, 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 risk estimation for the procedure that you are going to perform, and you have to justify that that risk outweigh the benefit for this patient. And you also have to make sure that you're not impacting the trial that the device is in. So I want to focus a little bit on terminologies because they are they are important as we as we think about it. Expanded use is different category has emergency use and compassionate use. We're talking about compassionate use today, but I started with expanded access because they're very similar. Emergency use is a bit different. And, you know, unfortunately, all of us got to experience a lot of discussion about emergency use during the COVID, you know, period of time. There was the FDA came in and said, well, we want an emergency use, uh, devices, vaccine, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it can be for a single patient, and it can be for multiple subjects as well. It's slightly different than compassionate use. They're not the same. And also, it is different than humanitarian use. And H if you're thinking about an HUD, you also have to keep that in, in, in consideration. And this is the FDA definition of uh, HUD, that you have, you have to have a condition that impact few number of people. Not as many. It cannot be a disease like aortic stenosis. It cannot be a disease like diabetes. It has to be a disease that impact, you know, a few people. And yes, the FDA has to look at some data. You know, the last, uh, you know, the one example that I thought about for HUD is the uh, 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 papyrus stent that was, was, uh, that was approved for humanitarian use. 
It was a study, small number of patients, but also the, the reason why you cannot do a big, large trial is because the prevalence of the disease is not high enough to do that. So what do you need to do if you're thinking about compassionate use? One, you have to discuss with the patient. You cannot not treat a patient with compassionate use without telling them that they are doing, they are participating in a compassionate use. The patient has to sign a consent you know, for the procedure, and that consent has to be approved or concurred by the uh, IRB. You have to discuss with the sponsor. The sponsor also has to agree with you that they are in agreement that their investigational device is appropriate for the case that you are treating. You also have to discuss with the hospital. You know, remember, this is not off-label use. You know, that is also uh, an important distinction. A lot of people think uh, they are similar. Off-label use, you're talking, you're talking about an FDA-approved device. You're using it for an unapproved condition. So, you know, a lot of cases presented this meeting about the use of angiovac for endocarditis. Angiovac is FDA-approved, is not FDA-approved for the indication of endocarditis. Sentinel device for, you know, I saw it used for uh, a TMVR in somebody who has appendage thrombus. The same concept. This is different. The hospital also have to understand because yes, you might be paid part of whatever DRG when it comes to CPT it might get a little bit more complicated. Again, this is not clinical research. This is investigational plan. I'm sorry, this is treatment plan. And then you have to submit your uh, your paperwork to the FDA. You need a you need a letter. Very often you need a a, a unconflicted uh, letter from a physician who is not part of the treating plan stating, yes, I reviewed the chart or I saw Mr. Smith in the clinic and I agree that this plan is, is reasonable to proceed with. And you have to have a treatment plan. You cannot tell the FDA, you know, yes, I got this, you know, this valve and I think it's going to work great in this condition and I'm going to put it in this patient and, and go home. It just doesn't work. You have to tell the FDA in that letter, what do you anticipate the treatment plan is going to look like pre intra and post uh, procedure. And then both of, both of, both of you that I, uh, submit to the IRB, submit to the FDA, and usually, the, 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 again, this is a, a, a treatment. It is not an investigation, so the IRB doesn't approve it. They concur with, the, with, with, with your idea. The FDA approve it. The IRB, most of the time, they concur with your treatment plan and the FDA uh, and the FDA letter, and give it time. I mean, again, this is not emergency use. Sometimes this process takes roughly about a month. You know, the FDA usually have four weeks after you submit your papers to respond. You know, the IRB may, might need some time, so allow it. You know, don't 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 think about it for a patient that you have to treat the following day or the day after. And I'm going to walk you through a process. I mean, the purpose of this is not to, uh, you know, uh, is not the case per se. But this is somebody that was treated for tricuspid regurgitation with tear. You know, great result, less than one. All the graphs, applause, everything is good. Patient was discharged. Everybody's happy. This patient showed up a follow up, and uh, you know, there was an uh, uh, SLD. Now, this was done part of an early feasibility trial. And you know this patient had this you know complication, exited the trial, more symptomatic. There is uh, uh, there is more TR than we started with. This patient was more more uh, more uh, symptomatic with severe TR. There is no commercially available option for this patient. Was seen by surgery, deemed not to be surgical candidate. There is no commercially available device to treat this condition. We elected to proceed with a, a compassionate use path for this patient. So what we've done, we took in. Uh, a, an animal heart. We uh, we plan the procedure. Uh, this is the evoke device. Try to figure out how is it going to work with the uh, uh, with the tear device in place. You know, and this is uh, you know this is the initial testing. Put everything submitted to the uh, 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 FDA. Submitted to the IRB. A month later, we got an FDA uh, an IRB concurrence, and we proceeded with the procedure. We put the evoke valve you know, uh, jailing the, uh, uh, the Pascal device, in this case, behind the valve, and we got a, uh, you know, those results, and as you can see, is very similar to the bench testing that we, you know, that we have done. You know, procedure time was, uh, was, uh, was reasonable. The outcome was, uh, was, was favorable for this patient, and we submitted a follow-up letter to the 
uh, FDA saying this is what happened and, uh, and uh, uh, this is the outcome of this case. You cannot use this data to say, okay, I want to try to get an indication for, uh, for uh, uh, Evoke in uh, uh, Val and in Tier that has, has SLD. This is compassionate use. It's one-time use. It's clinical practice. It is not clinical investigation. This is the family with the treating team. You know, the wife is, uh, you know, of, of, of that patient was extremely happy. This is why we do compassionate use is because we want to, you know, improve quality of life and save lives with devices that do not yet have uh, FDA approval. And we actually published it. You can publish, you know, compassionate use as well. There's nothing wrong with that, but you have to be careful. You are not publishing it as a research. You're publishing it as a case report or or a or a or a, or a series or or whatever whatever you want to call it. But you cannot use the data to say I want to get a indication for the tricuspid replacement in patients who have uh, previously had the uh, uh, SLDs with the TR device. So to conclude. Compassionate use is not the same as off-label use, is not the same as emergency use, and is not the same as humanitarian use. You have to be careful as you're using those terminologies, as we, when you talk to the patient, when you talk to the IRB. Prepare a treatment plan, prepare the patient, and prepare your hospital if you think of a compassionate use procedure that can, can be beneficial for your patients. You know, it's a collaborative effort between the patient, the FDA, and the IRB, and the sponsor for all of the approval. They all have to be in and equally invested. And, uh, and finally, it is not research, but yet you can, you can publish it if you, uh, if you wish. Thank you. Um, for us, so in, in terms of the reimbursement, you m might have touched on that a bit. You know, these are investigational devices. There's usually some agreement as to how these will be paid in, in terms of the trial. Does that just mirror the the trial and how that does, or how, how is this reimbursed? Yeah, so th this is the other thing that might sim take some time. Very often, very often there is a separate contract between the hospital and the sponsor uh, for the use of the device. So, for, so this is not going to be part of any of the research protocol that you might and might not have for the device. You don't actually have to be part of the trial. The, the definition of the compassionate use is the patient has to not qualify for the clinical trial. So if the patients qualify for, you know, for the clinical trial, then you cannot treat them in, in compassionate use. Usually the sponsor offer the device you know, free of cost to the institution, and the institution agree to treat this patient as a a standard of care uh, uh, a procedure, not device. So you get reimbursed for you know for whatever uh, whatever the procedure it is, and, and 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 that's about it. This is not a way for the hospital to make money. Most of the time, the hospital end up losing losing money on it. But most sponsors w will agree to participate in uh, in at least waiving the cost of the uh, uh, of the device. Uh, you know, it is it gets a little bit murky because. For example, if, if you have a patient with severe TR and you want to treat them with a TTVR device, part of compassionate use, but if the patient qualify for a clinical trial that is done in another center, then you have to also justify why you're not sending that patient to a clinical trial. By definition, a compassionate use, the patient cannot qualify for the clinical trial. Can I, can I just ask, so, but I just want to make sure I understand. So you all have had success in getting compassionate use cases paid for? Or, I mean, uh, how? I mean, because we we go through a lengthy process such that if 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 it's a compassion use case, we have to get approvals all the way through our admin, including our president, that signs off in the hospitals. Well, it signs off that basically, because there's no on label indication whatsoever, everything that's everything that costs anything is actually paid for by the hospital. That's why it's compassion use. Is because we're giving the resources and our care to this patient free of charge. And there's risk in that because if that, something doesn't go well, they end up in hospital for many days. It can cost the institution a lot of money. So I, I just want to make sure it's, 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 it's different. You, do you, I mean, what, that how's it been for you? That, that what you said, and, but I didn't know, so, you know who actually pays for the device. So, so, the, so the device is usually given to us, provided right. just courtesy, it's a courtesy you know, provision from the, the vendor or whoever makes the device. But the care costs are assumed by the hospital because it's compassionate. 
Correct. The most of the time, most of the time, this is the scenario. Now, you the hospital can recover some cost from a hospitalization standpoint, but not definitely not device, and ninety nine percent of the time, not the procedure. So you know, like it's very different than, um, for example, if you use the uh, uh, Angiovac for endocarditis, right? You have a billing code for that. I mean, this gets billed as a quote unquote ECMO. So the hospital recovers some cost. You know, the sponsor is not, there's, they're not going to pay for the device. It's FDA approved. And, you know, so there will be some costs recovered, but it's not what it is if you use it for PE. And it's very different indication, very different billing codes. They may try to bill based on a similar billing code if so, something sounds similar. Right. But you have to be very careful that you're not committing Medi Medicare fraud and billing for something that you're not doing. So if yeah. you, so in this case, you cannot bill for tricuspid valve replacement. Correct. You just cannot, and this is is very important because you cannot. This patient cannot leave the hospital with a CMS built to CMS as this patient got a, a tricuspid valve replacement. This patient, for example, that I presented, got the valve uh, covered by Edwards. You know, got the uh, procedure covered by our health system, and this is why you have to get approval, as Paul say, most yeah. of the time, if not all of the time, to the highest level of the hospital. You cannot do it for every patient. But yet, yeah, this patient, for example, got Medicare got billed for a heart failure hospitalization for this patient, which is, you know, doesn't cover the cost. But this is what you, you can bill, because this patient was symptomatic, got hospitalized, you know, got diarrhea, so you got the heart failure hospitalization, but it's not gonna cover the OR time, it's not gonna cover the procedure itself. Great, thanks Faraz. I think Thank we'll, <clears throat> we'll invite Vino to come up and present uh, his case. Okay, so these are my, um, the, okay, great. So these are my disclosures. So this is, I didn't, I'm not gonna tell you exactly what we're gonna do. So um, this is an 80 year old who presents um, actually from my friends at University of Pennsylvania, saw this patient. Um, and they called me up one day, um, Wilson Zito and one of the cardiologists, and said, hey, can you take a look at this patient? And so it was an 80-year-old that they had done, uh, who presented with fatigue, decreased energy, progressive shortness of breath. He walked over two miles a day, very active guy. He was actually a former CEO of a, of a major company that um, mined most of the diamonds in America. So he was the guy that owned the, the, the actual mines that you would extract diamonds from um, and was unbelievably active. He lived half the time in New Jersey, half the time in Florida, and his jet would take him back and forth whenever he was ready to. to he, 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 he paid for the goddamn hospital. What are you talking about? I mean, he paid for everything. So, um, so he shows up, and he can't now walk 100 feet. Um, he's on good GDMT. He's on all the stuff. Sorry, Lasix is misspelled. Um, and then he's got stage three CKD. He's um, had an emergency type A. He was actually Joe Bavaria's patient. Joe, of course, like most, uh, most good surgeons, was traveling when he actually tore his aorta. And so now he calls and Wilson Zito happens to be in town and Wilson does his type A dissection. Um, and then he also has CLL and he's been on and off and he's currently on treatment for this with immunosuppressants for his CLL. And he's on a hip replacement. And so he shows up in their office now with severe AR and severe um, functional MR um, and some mild TR. And here's his um, uh, echoes. So you can see, I think all of us would agree, he's got a lot of aortic regurgitation. And this is his uh, mitral regurgitation. I think the next video will kick in in a second. So the guys at Pennsylvania said, we don't really want to operate on this guy. He's got double valve, he's, got, he's on immunotherapy for his CLL, it's pretty active still. And you know, what, what can, you, can, you know, can you guys do something for him? So he flew, um, he had his pilot fly his jet down, and then we took a look at him. And so and here's the other problem, he still has a type B dissection. And you can see his root is completely messed up, right? So he's got this graft here, and then he's got this big bulbous type of root going on right here, he still has this type B dissection. So what do you do with this patient at this point? 
So, of course, we get a CT scan on him, and this is what he has. He has a perimeter of 88.4, which is out of any device that we can use in the United States. So he's got this big kind of uh, issue here in the aortic where the tube graft was. Um, he was basically almost arresting when they operated on him. Um, and so, you know, they didn't want to go back in. We didn't think he'd be a great case either for a redo. And he falls out of the IFU for any device that we can do. So what do we do on him? So do I do a, you know, go against Bavaria and Wilson and say, we'll, we'll just operate on him? Do we do a BE, um, a balloon expandable TAVR off-label? Do we do a SCV off-label? Do we um, do it, like we saw a case yesterday, do we do a self-expanding followed by a balloon expandable? Or do we do uh, something in the trial? Jason, any, any, any takers on any of these? <coughs> We're obviously in a compassionate use. So. It'd be great if you had a dedicated device for this pathology to use. I think everything else is you know, fraught with you know, a lot of embolization risk and migration risk. So I mean, I'd probably try to see if you could get something compassionate use. Yeah, obviously that's why we're in this session. Anybody else, any other uh, thoughts? Steve, you can just reoperate on him. You're a mitral guy. You just gonna reoperate on him? No? So, yeah. So this is, his, uh, so we ended up obviously taking him to the cath lab um, and we ended up doing a Yenna valve on him, compassionate pathway. It didn't take us a month. It took us somewhere around two to three months. Um, by the time we got all the paperwork done, IRB saw it, the sponsor has agreed to it. it, they send a letter to the FDA, we send a letter to the FDA, it's about two to three months. I would say that, that that's what our process is. So I would say that by the time we started in January, by the time we actually did the procedure, it was April. And so it took us a while to do this. Meanwhile, of course, he's texting me all the time. Um, so this is what his root angiogram looks like. A lot of AI, a decent sized root, and then you can see, of course, his, his tube graph right here. Um, and then, of course, looks like they weaved him, by the way, if you see this, this is sternal wires, plus a weave on both sides, a Robichek weave. Um, so something we weren't interested in. And remember, he falls out of the IFU for a Yenival, so we could not put him in the trial. Here's the other problem. We couldn't get, it took us, I don't have that picture, it took us almost 20, 30 minutes just to get the wire across the graph. We couldn't get the wire across his stenosis, his kind of graph. When, when surgeons put the, put the um, aorta back together, we couldn't actually get the wire across, so it took us forever. So what we ended up doing is actually snaring the nose cone of the device. Remember, the inner valve sheath goes all the way down to here. We actually couldn't, we tried this once and we couldn't do it. And so what we ended up having to do is reboot everything um, and remember, he's got a dissected aorta also. We ended up having to snare, get, make sure we're in the right lumens, uh, and then snare here and allow the snare to help us to just get across the arch because we couldn't get across the arch. It was just impossible. Um, and so here, we, we got stuck here, so we used that, and then we couldn't get across the graft. We couldn't get across the stenosis at all. So we have this, the same snare, we tried to move it here, Pradeep and I were doing this case, but we tried to move it here, we couldn't move it. You see, we're pushing pretty hard. We couldn't do that. And then um, Pradeep and I decided, well, why don't we bring it all the way here? Then we brought the snare here and then pushed it all the way across his suture line. We couldn't get across either suture line. So we used a snare to get across the arch, and then we used a the same snare up top, but that didn't work. And then we used a snare and we just kind of rebrouted the snare you see this all one kind of cine that we have, or um, fluoro, and then we released the snare, brought it down here, and then pulled hard. And while Pradeep is pulling hard, I'm pushing really hard. You can see how much we've bent the whole thing from all the way across the arch, and we we're able to get it across. I mean, uh, it, it has some limitation. You know, the flex knob is there, but it's not great. And uh, it, can, it can be hard to get things around that area. Um, not Yenaval, but another technology, when we had this trouble, we actually went transepal and snared. So we, we created a rail, LA to L, L, aorta. That would have been it, our next Yeah, thing, right? so I was gonna ask you if you thought about doing it that way, but. We, you know, we tried this first, and then we were gonna do transeptal if that didn't work. Yes, yeah. Because, you know, we were, we were thinking ways. Luckily, you can see, you know, taking the tip, taking the snare here didn't work. When we brought it here, we were able to jam it across the suture line. I mean, it looks, are you snaring on the dilator there? Or yeah, we're on, snaring on the dilator. Okay. All right. Yeah. 
And so we ended up doing that. And then, of course, we're able to now, you can see we've positioned and, and partially opened the valve right here um, in the root. Now we're able to get everything. And once you get this uh, entire sheath across the two suture lines, then it became somewhat um, some blunt simpler. And here we're just doing rotational. Um, what you're doing is you're looking for this middle component right here. If it's going the opposite way of the gantry moving in the C-arm, um, and then you know you're in the right cusp. Um, at that point, we went ahead um, and deployed the valve right here um, after much kind of consternation. Um, we pace at um, about 120 to 140 when we do this now. At first, we didn't pace, but now we always pace. And here you can see the result. Absolutely zero AI for, uh, for this patient. Um, and then you can see here, um, the other thing is you have to be really careful taking the nose cone out. Um, and uh, once, and, and we generally don't do this under T or intubation, but for this patient we did it. You can see all of his aortic insufficiency has gone away. What our plans were for him was to go ahead and fix the AI, compassionate, and then try to put him into a research trial, right? Because he had severe FMR before, so Yenavelv had two reasons not to take him. One was because of the, the uh, perimeter was too large, and number two, because of his um, severe MR. Well, this is his echo. I, I had a one-month echo and a four-month echo. All of his MR is gone. All of it, gone, just gone. So not only did we fix his aortic insufficiency, we we completely fixed his FMR. And by the way, his mean gradient was three. Um, and so really, um, a, you know, a good result. Obviously, the Yenna valve, um, <clears throat> and this is what we were stuck with. They are in the process of making one larger valve, but you see, we were 88, and they were 85. So they just would not approve him in any of the trials. Um, this study has now been done. Uh, we're looking at submitting a paper or an abstract for TCT later this year um, for um, uh, the outcomes for this. Hopefully, it will be FDA. We're hoping um, FDA approved next year, so you'll be able to have uh, access to this. Off-label TAVR have had marginal outcomes and should be avoided if possible. AR-specific devices are available in, in Europe but not in the U.S., and hopefully we'll have this available to you next year. And, of course, we think that having a heart team look at this um, is, is the smartest way to do it. Thank you very much. Can you, um, so you, just a technical question. So when you tried to get the sheath across the arch, it wouldn't go, and then you did the snare. Um, how did you get, did you, did you have to remove the entire system from the body and then put the snare in over the wire and then put the sheath back? I mean, there is a sheath with the Genoval system, or is it sheathless? We just, we just pulled it back and parked it and then got bigger sheath access on the other side. Oh, okay. So we just had a regular, you know, six or seven French sheath that we normally do just for pigtail access. <clears throat> we actually took that out and upgraded it and put the snare through that. Um, and so uh, we had to upgrade the sheath. Um, I think we used like a 12 or yeah, something you, like that. The sheath came from the other groin. The other So groin. then you had to like pull everything out and recross the That's right. valve and go through. Okay, I got yep. it. Yep. Have you done this before? Have you used snares to pull self-expanding valves? Yeah, I think this is a, this is a wonderful demonstration of uh, you know how to manage a, a challenge that you know you kind of thought about but not 100% prepared for. And I think that you know the snare has been you know we we've used it we've seen it in valve and valve. Sometimes if you know especially if you're using a a, a valve that gets stuck on the post of the bioprosthetic valve. You know, a little snare and pull, uh, you know, would do it. What we also have done is uh, not snare from the groin, but snare from the left subclavian. That way, the, you know, the force of the pull will be easier, and you don't have to pull uh, as hard, and it pulls you away from the outer cur curve, the, uh, you know, of the aorta. The technique is the same. You, uh, you know, you, you have to, unfortunately, recross again, put the snare in the arch, and then advance your big tail or whatever through the snare. And then use that, but snaring from the wrist, especially the left, is uh, it also even make it uh, more e easier. Uh, you know, you're not prepared for it, so the arm is not uh, sterilized, and you know it takes a couple uh, uh, minutes for the staff to do that. But that's also a possibility. It's a great Has case. Anybody else done the snare, Mark? Or anyone from Mark? Or Same as the way that the you know, did it from the leg. Yeah. Has anybody used a steerable? Sometimes we had a case where one of my partners tried and couldn't get it to work, 
And uh, I'm not sure if it was snare positioning, but or if I actually a steerable might work, you know, just to grab, because the issue is that you're pulling inferior and you can't get it to go lateral. And, uh, and so sometimes, you know, just change the trajectory. I like your idea going from the left arm. And you can tell that when we were pulling the snare, it, moved, it went from the greater curvature. We were yes. pulling so hard That's that right. it actually moved all the way to the lower, That's lesser right. curvature. Yeah, it's really uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah especially when <laughs> guys had a dissection. Yes, right. Gradually yeah. order. Yeah. yeah. So. All right. Great. Thanks. Thank you. So, you know, next is uh, the Jason Rogers. I mean, Vino, the one that you want to be if you want to stay around. So, so Jason is also going to talk us about uh, a compassionate use for an LAO extraction action. Well, Anita walked out during my case I presented yesterday, so I'm hoping this one is exciting enough to make her stay in the room. But this is called uh, LAO Extraction Action. Um, so this is a 69-year-old gentleman who received a Watchman device. And the indication was um, interesting. I mean, I think mostly the patient was not wanting to take an anticoagulant but did not have any overt bleeding problem and had a TE-guided uh, LAO with a th uh, reportedly 31 millimeter Watchman Flex, that is what the report said, at an outside hospital. So this was the procedural TEE and you can see the sizing and the placement of the device here in this single zero degree view looks, looks reasonable and this was reported as a 31 millimeter uh, Watchman device. So it looks good. Unfortunately, they came back at 10 weeks for their TE, and this is what they saw on the initial TE view. So you can see the Watchman is sticking out a lot, and this is not, you know, this is not normal. So a little more imaging was done, uh, including a 3D Recon, and you can see the anatomy of the appendage was this chicken wing, and the device is essentially completely migrated out into the left atrium. It's not within the appendage uh, at all, and it's actually kind of a mystery as to how it's actually still there and not just completely embolized, right? Because you can see it's a little bit, uh, probably a few anchors along this limbus here, the pulmonary vein, but it, probably everywhere else there isn't any securement. So somehow there's some early fibrosis or maybe a few anchors um, keeping this in place, but it, it's, it's obviously can't stay here. Can't, we can't leave it uh, in this position. And the other interesting thing was when we actually measured the crown diameter on CT, it was exactly 27 millimeters. So whether this, there were multiple devices attempted. I mean, this was a chicken wing. It's a difficult anatomy. Maybe, maybe there was a, an upsizing and, and there was some confusion about what was the final size device that was put in. But we measured 27, so that, that may have been part of it as well, um, the reason that this happened. So the question is what to do with this patient. And, you know, patients young, they're otherwise fairly low surgical risk. Um, so you know, the easiest and, and most traditional path would be surgical removal of the device. Um, and, I mean, Dr. Bowling, you've, you've operated on, on cases like this. I mean, what, would this be a pretty straightforward operation? Yeah, very straightforward. Yeah. Um, but you'd, you'd have to do cardiopulmonary bypass. You would, you'd have to arrest the heart. There's no way to do this off yeah. pump, right? So you'd arrest the heart and, and you'd either over sew it or, or do an atrial clip or something. And then, you know, we did want to explain, the patient, of course, was not, not excited to have surgery. I mean, remember, the whole reason that he had this procedure in the first place was he, he just didn't really want to take a blood thinner. So the patient is obviously adverse to a lot of things, just even a pill. So take, taking him to surgery was not something that he really wanted. So we did investigate the feasibility of transcatheter device extraction. There had been, you know, verbal reports that people had done this in the past, so we wanted to explore this. And, and the device that we use is this uh, Raptor device. So what we, what we decided was we needed something very rigid and 
and had a lot of support to, to pull the device into. So we chose a mitra clip guide. Uh, that's 23 French at the tip and 25 French at the groin. And we had this hybrid extraction plan where we would place this raptor um, forceps. And this is a very interesting uh, forceps it's called the raptor. And if you read about it, it has a combination alligator tooth and rat tooth uh, design. So what does that mean? So rat tooth, if you can think about it, you know, they're, they got the little sharp incisors. So at the tip, it has uh, these incisors, but then all along the uh, arm of the forcep, there are smaller teeth like an alligator. So it's, they, they market it as a rat, rat tooth combination, rat and alligator tooth forcep. So uh, yeah, chimeric uh, hybrid transgenic um, forcep. So, we put, so we, the idea was we would, we would grasp the face of the device with the raptor, but there was some question of whether this would, you know, slip off, off these raptors, and so we, we also decided to use a snare, and we practiced this multiple times on the bench top. And one interesting part of this was the question of where to grasp the device. So you would think it would be best to grasp, here's the central, if we grasp it right in the center, that would be the natural way the device is to attach the delivery cable. However, this was actually one of the hardest ways to get it. It really wouldn't go in. I think because there's a lot of rigidity where the, um, the struts of the device enter the hub, there's a lot of radial strength there, and it gets hard to re-collapse it, re-collapse uh, it, collapse, yeah, uh, at that point. So the central hub was not a good. We also then explored whether we could grasp the shoulder of the device, uh, where the crown is, where we measure the diameter, and what happened here is that the hub itself then kind of folds and, and interferes with um, bringing it into the sheath. So what we finally just concluded through, through repeated experimentation here really was that if you, if you grab it on the face of the device or, or near the hub but not at the hub, then it, then it will come in. So that was the target goal was to be kind of near the face or on the face, but not at the hub or near the edge. And that, that actually worked well for, for the actual procedure. So, so we discussed this with our heart team. We, we, we did it in the hybrid OR. Um, our surgeons agreed to support the case. Uh, the patient agreed to this. And, and we really did consider you know, the chance that there could be some injury to the appendage. I, I think we felt the risk was actually very low given the fact that there really wasn't any, the, the device really wasn't even in the appendage anymore. So I think if you're going to attempt this and the device is still in the appendage, that's a little bit of a different scenario. Um, so we did use embolic protection uh, sentinel device. We did this under T guidance and um, you know here's the uh, mitra clip guide being brought into the and so here's the final kind of image here where we have the guide directed right at the face of the device and we're, it was actually, we could never really get the snare to go around the device because of the, the trajectory of the, the guide. It just, it just wouldn't, wouldn't go over it. So we had it nearby, but we couldn't actually get it to go over it and uh, engulf it like we did on the bench top. So that ended up not really working very well. But, what we were able to do was to, to grasp the, f the face of it with this um, forcep. And you can see the forcep here. I mean, this is actually really originally developed for endoscopic retrieval of, of foreign objects like from your gut, like kids who swallow, you know, paper clips or whatever. I mean, you can, you can pull out almost anything with this, this Raptor device. But it can be used um, endovascularly as well. And I would recommend that anybody who's doing uh, LAO procedures should have one of these on their shelf because if you do have a device embolization, um, this is probably one of the best ways to grab onto the device, whether you ultimately then use a snare as well. But, you know, a, a, for instance, a watchman is very, right, it, there's, it's very smooth. There's not really anything to, to snare. There's no hub like a traditional Amplatzer device has. Uh, so you need something to grab onto it. Anyway, so this is the, the final moment here where we were at the face of the device and you can see fluoroscopically that we were able to pull it into the, into the guide. And the guide, you see, is pretty rigid. It doesn't even you know, deflect at all. Um, 
And then here's the TEE you see on this side. This is, I think, pretty, so you see the device there, and then it just kind of disappears. So, and there was a little jump as, as we pulled it in, and of course that was, that was a moment we're looking on TEE, but I mean, it came in and then it came out, and then this is what we found. This is the device, uh, the back side of the device. So there's you know, some degree of organized thrombus behind it, and then we did capture some debris in the filter too, so we're glad that we used that. I think we, you know, retrospect, maybe we should have put in two filters and another one from the left, left arm as well. But patient went home the very next day, and the decision was made that the patient would just continue on their, their NOAC. We didn't, we didn't go in and put in another device, um, and then that would be a discussion for another day. So in summary, I think um, the important case features here are that we did a lot of procedural planning and, and thinking about this. Uh, we did use carotid embolic protection. This is the first case of using a, a G4 MitraClip guide for LAO extraction. And, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that you do this, you know, in, in any case. I think this was a special case. There, there was, you know, another case that I heard of that was similar where they actually had an effusion. They did the same technique and patient had an effusion, actually had to go to the OR. So um, proceed with caution. So thank you for your attention. That was a great case. See, I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Just a question, I mean, your CT scan, I think that's crucial when you're gonna do this. If you had seen thrombus behind the device, I would assume that that would be a reason to not do it. If you, I think, yeah, scan. at that point, we would have deferred and, and gone to surgery because that's just such a more controlled scenario. But yeah, it was, it was amazingly clean looking. The device had nothing on it, apparently. And this was only, you know, uh, within a few months, but nothing we could see behind and, and nothing. Patients in sinus rhythm, there's a lot of flow. Uh, I think they're just, they're, it was just being washed, you know, so that, that was fortunate. So the other thing I would just ask is you did a lot of bench work before, and I think that's crucial when you're going to use equipment that's not, you know, engineered for what you're trying to do. So, and, you know, just some advice for people who, who want to do something they've never done before. You would spend, I, I'm assuming the planning is crucial, and then figuring out what equipment fits, because the last thing you want to do is be in that case and realize you know, these things aren't compatible, one thing doesn't go into the other. So can you just go through your thought process of like how you're gonna organize? Yeah, I mean, I think anytime you're, you're trying something, if you can practice on, on the, on the, even on the back table, you know, especially like with paravalvular leaks, sometimes you're, you're combining nested catheters and you're using plugs and, and you're not sure. I, I would just, you know, you can even be done, but it's always better to practice outside the patient than in the patient. In this case, uh, you know, we saved a mitra clip guide from a from another case that we had done, and the mitra clip guide is fairly long, and a lot of you know a standard, for instance, a standard diagnostic catheter will not even reach the tip of a mitra clip guide. If you put a hundred centimeter um, multi-purpose catheter in a in a mitra clip guide, it won't it won't it won't come out the tip. You need a special 110 or 120 catheter. So all of these length issues are important, and, and it's important to practice and, and make sure that everything's going to fit. Yeah. We, we paid for it, yeah, yeah, we paid for it, yeah, they didn't give it to us, yeah, so, and that, and that triggers, the cost of a mitra clip is triggered by the opening of the guide, right, so, um, so, yeah, we did. So, so, Jason, this is a fantastic case, and, 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 and for those who are out there who think that, yeah, I mean, this might be a good idea to do, how do you approach the patient? Like, what, what conversation you have? I mean, patients ask us all the time, how many times you've done this? Or uh, what is your experience with this? How, <laughs> how do you approach the conversation with the patient? Yeah, I mean, I think this one is a pretty, it's a pretty simple um, problem. And you can show them a picture, and, and they get the idea of, of basically grabbing it and removing it. Um, so, um, I, so I, but I think it's important to explain, you know, that, you know, wh what is the condition, what are the, what's the equipment you're using, and what are the potential uh, risks, and, and so, you know, the patient was agreeable to all of those, yeah. Can I just ask, so the risk, one of the biggest risks here is, you know, the appendage ruptures. Right. Or bleeding. What? What? Did you have ECMO on standby? Yeah, did so perfusionists. We, exactly. Or, okay. Yeah, we had, we had perfusionists, we had cannulas, uh, we had, you know, uh, CT surgery in the room. So we were ready to go on pump if needed. You know, we had the chest prep to put in a pericardial drain if we needed that as well. So we were ready to, yeah, basically go on bypass. And the other case that you know of, was it 
was there bleeding because it was further in? The the, the device was further inside. I, I think inside it was further feet? in. Yeah. Um, I didn't see the images, but I think it was much more um, right in in you know into the appendage. Um, and uh, and patient, the patient that patient survived, and I think I don't think it was like an emergency, like it wasn't like the patient was coding, but there was an effusion. They were able to, but eventually needed to go to the OR. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and we we saw a couple cases yesterday like this with these shallow chicken wings. Uh, you know, the anchoring is you know not circumferential. You you have anchoring maybe 180 or 270 arc, and and then there's part of it that's not anchored. And and these things are the ones that you worry about migration. And and I think it just squirted out. It you know whether it was too big or too small. Um, you know, even a 27 may have been a little big there. So this this was, a, I think, a challenging anatomy. And we saw that yesterday, like a lot of cases where, where patients had these attempted in this anatomy and it, it, it either they couldn't do it or it, there was migration later or movement. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Thank great you. case. So, so the next... Uh, you know, the next presentation is uh, one of the chair of this session who's going to talk to us about another compassionate uh, use case. And uh, Anita, welcome thank and thank you. So this is a patient um, that was referred to. He's a 65-year-old male and came in in right-sided heart failure, <clears throat> excuse me, anasarca, liver dysfunction, acute renal failure. And so his, his previous history is an apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He's on medical therapy, atrial fibrillation. He has a permanent pacemaker. But he's had multiple repeated admissions for right-sided heart failure. He's had repeated paracentesis, thoracic drains for, for bilateral pleural fusions. And so this is um, his imaging results. So he had preserved LV function. It's a mild MR, but torrential TR. The RV wasn't dilated, but he had moderate to severe RV dysfunction, and he had a pulmonary pressure of 60. And so he had a right heart cath, and one of the thoughts um, at the time by the treating physician was perhaps we could transplant this patient. I'll show you some images of his left ventricle, but really had biventricular um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, just non-obstructive. So these were his right heart pressures. So if you look at this, he's got a mean RA pressure of 32. He's got an RV end diastolic pressure of 32, so he's got quite severe diastolic dysfunction of the RV as well. His PA pressures are, you know, moderately increased. His wedge is 29. So if we think back to, to triluminate and getting into triluminate, for example, he's not a patient that would get approved just on the basis of a really high wedge pressure and all his comorbidities. Uh, pardon? No, hope. no, no hope. And um, his cardiac output, as you can see, was, was low. And his PVR was high. And so this wasn't felt to be a great candidate for transplant. So this is his imaging. So this is on the right side. You can see his pacemaker lead. You see he's got his TR. This is the left ventricle. So you can see he's got a really thick left ventricle, non-obstructive, but definitely an apical cardiomyopathy. You can see his TR a little bit better. So there was a heart team meeting. And so, you know, for the most part, these patients are discussed in the transplant meetings. And the interventional cardiologists don't generally get invited. I got invited to this meeting. I wasn't sure what I was going to listen to when I got there. Generally, it's about mitral. But, you know, they presented this case, and he was felt to be obviously a high-risk surgical candidate. I don't know if you would want to operate. What, what can you do for somebody like this with a left ventricle that's like this? But he also has liver failure. Now he's got acute renal failure. He wasn't a candidate for heart transplant at the time. They felt um, with the acute renal failure, the liver failure, the elevated PVR, he wasn't going to survive transplant. Um, and we assessed him for, for a tricuspid tear following this meeting and felt it was favorable, but he had a pacemaker lead. And so, you know, obviously he's not a candidate for triluminate. The question at the heart team meeting was, could we palliate him with a triclip procedure? I wasn't sure it was going to make a huge difference, and I wasn't sure where we were going to go after that. So if you palliate him, you know, you're hopefully going to keep him out of hospital a bit, but what's the long-term outcomes? But we decided to try it, so uh, we went ahead and did the procedure. We were pretty sure we weren't going to kill him, so we were going to give it a go and see how we did. So um, I'm not going to go through all the details of this, but we put our first clip on. We got some reduction, and then we ended up with a second clip, and we were pretty happy. We got his TR down from five to, you know, one to two. 
And so he recovered. We were able to get him off CVVH. He was discharged four days later. His TR came down to two. He got better over the uh, ensuing months. So I followed him after that. He had no recurrent emissions for paracentesis or pleurofusions, but he just felt crappy. You know, he just didn't feel good. I mean, if you think about all his comorbidities, his liver um, failure improved, his liver enzymes normalized. And so I sent him back for a transplant assessment because he was still, you know, progressive fatigue, decreased exercise tolerance. So I recast him to see um, what his numbers were like post. So I put his previous right heart cath on the right, and then the, the right heart cath I did. This is about three months post triclip. And so you can see his LVEF has gone down. So he is you know, getting worse. He doesn't feel well. His PA pressures are a little bit lower, but look at his right heart pressure. So his right atrium now is down to 16. Um, his RV end diastolic is still elevated, but it's at 20. His PVR has come down a little bit, and his cardiac output's gone up, considering um, the, what he was like prior to the procedure. So at this point, I referred him back for transplant, and he actually did get transplanted three months later um, and did well, and he's doing well. He's about uh, two years out now post-transplant. The transplant course wasn't easy, though, so he ended up on milrinone and all kinds of um, inhaled uh, uh, nitric oxide, et cetera, post. It was a bit rocky. His PVR was a little bit elevated, but he did well. And so I think for this case, what was interesting and something I learned from this is the importance of the heart team discussion. So we have heart failure involved when we want to do mitral clips, but it is rare that we get invited to their transplant meetings. And, you know, we have done mitral clips as bridge to transplant. So this was an interesting case where we bridged someone to transplant for tricuspid. I um, mean, it is a safe procedure even in these really sick patients. And, you know, maybe it will be a bridge for some of these patients. It's hard to know, but in this particular case, it worked well. He was young and he got what he eventually needed, which was a transplant, and, and he's doing well. So I, I didn't show you all his medical therapy, but one of the things we were able to do once we were treated, his TR is really try to optimize a little bit more his medical therapy. So I do think the ability to optimize the medical therapy helped him, but we had still reached a point where, despite maximal medical therapy and treating his TR, he just wasn't doing well clinically. Yeah, his volume status improved significantly. And his volume, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think this is a fascinating case for a, a lot of a lot of things to talk about here, um, especially in light of our, our you know, symposium yesterday and talking about the impact of TR reduction, what are clinically meaningful uh, endpoints for therapy, you know, design of clinical trials to show those endpoints. I mean, for you, First of all, Triclip is approved in Europe. Or in it is Canada. approved in Canada. Yeah. That's not part of Europe. No. Canada. So, we're OU, um, yes, but we're not in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> so you can use it whenever you would like, right? I mean, um, but here's a patient who you got a very good result. And, you know, by all objective criteria, had very little benefit, right? I mean, he, the patient wasn't feeling better. They, they you know... We can't say they live, we don't, we're not falling for mortality, but I mean, on a lot of endpoints that we would conventionally use, six minute walk tests, maybe KCCQ, it would all been negative. And yet you bridged him to another therapy. Um, so, what I mean, and again, the question is why? Why did this patient not have any response? I mean, the volume status got better, the TR went down, the LV's not even that bad. It's like 45%. I mean, why does this patient so symptomatic? Does it all come down to the RV? I mean, well, I mean, I think he has multiple problems, right? It'd be simple to say that we fixed the TR, but we certainly didn't fix his, we didn't fix his diastolic dysfunction, his apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He's got some diastolic dysfunction, quite significant, I would say, on the right side, better once we, we offloaded the volume, but his RV EDP was still 20. So, you know, I mean, I think it's probably naive and overly enthusiastic to think if we treat TR in those patients, we're gonna make a massive difference because it's not the primary problem in that patient. It's, it's a result of everything else that's going on. It certainly destabilized him. But so that's the problem with these trials, because if we take these kinds of patients, this is an isolated TR, you know, so. I guess I didn't see all of his LV. Uh, so I mean, I just showed one image, but he had a very, very thick ventricle. Like I didn't show the, yeah. cardiomyopathy yeah. in a way. Okay. So what he had, this wasn't a planned bridge to transplant. I thought they turned him down. They did. Yeah. So they did turn him down. Exactly. And so when I, they asked me to do it, I thought, well, what's the end game? What are we doing? And they said, well, you know, he's 65. Maybe you can make him feel better. So, Anita, the, the, you know, I, I also agree with what Steve was saying. We see those, we get asked more and more about doing 
tier procedures in patients who are decompensated. You know, in the hospital, you know, in this case, severe TR, but also happen, you know, severe MR, they're hospitalized, heart failure, sometimes on mirror note, and they have severe uh, tricuspid regurgitations, like, well, can you clip them as a, uh, a palliative or a bridge to decision? I mean, bridge to decision is the name, right? I mean, we've yeah, done yeah, it. That's exactly. What, what, are, what are your thoughts about how we approach those patients who are acutely decompensated uh, on inotropes sometimes with a, a bridge to de uh, decisions? Do we need to get them better? Should we just, you know, do, is, is it okay to do them in the state of decompensation? And if they don't get out of it, then they don't deserve a clip. But some people are, you know, doing tear for both tricuspid and mitral in the acute state. I mean, we've done it for acute papillary muscle ruptures as well. And patients who are too sick that surgeons won't operate, we do it to bridge to surgery. So we are doing it. Where I find it more difficult is actually not those cases, but the cases are severe LV dysfunction for bridge to transplant. Because if they never make it to transplant, you know, we're doing all this, we don't know how we're going to end up. And so we've refused a lot of patients on the basis of bridge to decision, we don't want to do it. Unless you guarantee us that you're going to try to transplant this patient, or, or LVAD or something, we're not going to do it. Because bridge to decision is a difficult thing. We're putting an awful lot of effort into something that, you know, we don't know that anything's going to happen with these patients. I don't know. In Minnesota, we tend to be really <laughs> passionate, compassionate. I don't. I mean, if we, we, I think we tend to say, and I don't want to speak for our entire team, but we tend to say, look, if it doesn't hurt them, and it might help, it, it's it's a good thing to consider because, you know, it's the 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 cards are turned and. Let's say this were cancer and life threatening, and these patients had no options, and they're just looking for something, and it's safe. I, I think it's okay. I think it's okay, and I think this bridge the decision, you have to do it in the context of an entire team for sure, and we have to have some idea what the exit or end game would be, but sometimes we just do things because we just can, and we think it's safe, and I'll just leave it at that. I don't, I don't want to be too philosophical about it, but it's 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 it's. It's, it's a different approach. Um, but I think it's a double-edged sword because we've done that in the past, and then what I hear is, well, you do mitral clip, that never works. The patients never get better. Well, right? Yeah. So, you know, we, yeah. we try, but I think there's a balance. It's, it's a difficult well, balance. <clears throat> so what I do is, whenever I do that in, in that situation, I write salvage all over the chart. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I don't want you to think that I clip everything. Uh -huh. I, don't, I, don't, I don't want you to think that at all. Um, but it, it's, it's, an important, it's an important thing to at least think about, you know, for these patients. You know, the papillary muscle ruptures, we've done a number of them, and it's been an amazing bridge. And you have about 10 minutes to think about it. It's not like you're going to have an IRB approval overnight to talk about these things. And so it, it's, 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 it, it's important. It's just great yep. to talk about. Well, you should talk to my surgeons. <laughs> Refer to Michigan. <laughs> um, no, this is such a great case because it just illustrates how complicated these patients are. And, you know, for me, this therapy is exciting but also very stressful because when you're asked to, you know, it's, there, it, there's so many things going on. And, you know, the idea that you're putting a clip in and they'll get, you know, it's, it's a whole heart team. Everybody has to be involved. My first thought when you showed those hemodynamics was I wouldn't touch that patient at all unless they were on milrinone, on a Lasix drip, and getting you know IV diarrheal like for a week, and and let's see what happens and and prehabbing like that patient need to be prehabbed maximally. I, I don't know if they were, but I mean for sure this is not a patient that comes as an outpatient for T tier. This is a patient who's going to be in the hospital. They're going to be, I mean minimum on milrinone. I would say and you're doing everything possible to optimize them medically before you bring them to the cath lab. Yeah, that's in fact what we did. We put them on CVVH and, and managed to do that. I mean, you sure, you sure made the clip look easy. Would you do that with a guarantee up front that somebody, if you clip them, I will put an RVAD or I will transfer them? I try to be out of town when those decisions are being made. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, there's, there's, but there's no guarantee, but there is a lot of pressure from, from the patient and the heart failure team and, and everyone, because uh, unfortunately, if something can be done, often, you know, 
as we say in medicine, uh, you know, errors of omission are harder than errors of commission. It's much harder to say you're not going to do something to a patient and a family than just to do it, you know, which I hate that. But that's the reality. Yeah, very true. Maybe I'll get Bruce to come up. He's got the next case. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. And again, Paul, thanks for the opportunity to participate in this great conference. I think when I look back at, at this, I think the, I'll rename this CVI 2023 TR is bad. That seems to be, um, that seems to be the recurring, recurring. I'm glad we all learned that. Yeah, which, which I think a lot of us in this space uh, know, but I, I think we've really highlighted that. And it's interesting because most of the cases that I get called for lately for compassionate use type indications are mostly TR cases. Um, I used to think it was a bad thing when the surgeons referred cases to structural. I'd say, oh, if it's a surgeon referring it, it must be really bad. And now I know it's a bad thing. It's when the MCS and the heart failure team refer cases to structural. Those are the really, really bad cases. But we've seen a lot of these. This is actually not compassionate use. It's, it's really more of an off-label. And the only other thing I'll mention to, to Vino's point is I think the process just takes too long, which is really, you know, I understand you have to do your due diligence and we have to do all of the things with the IRB and the FDA and the companies, but for us it's been really a problem and we've had a few patients, when they come to us, I'll initiate the process immediately and then we've had a few patients basically die, you know, as we've waited to go through the compassionate use process, which can be pretty frustrating because there are a few that I think we probably could have helped, um, but it just took too long to get it across the finish line. Anyway, with that, this is a 62-year-old patient who was referred from an outside hospital where she originally presented, this was just a few months ago, with acute systolic heart failure. She was cath there, she had critical coronary disease, severe LV dysfunction, moderate RV dysfunction, and severe TR. A balloon pump was placed and she was transferred, this hospital is within our system, she was transferred to our, our facility, North Shore, for surgical evaluation. Ultimately, um, past medical history, as you can see there, uh, she did undergo a four vessel bypass and a tricuspid repair with a 28 physio ring. She struggled. Um, oh, they didn't, push. okay. I changed my slides a little bit and they didn't, uh, they didn't change the order. So bottom line is uh, she struggled in the OR. We'll go back to that other slide. Um, she was unable to be weaned from bypass. Uh, she was on for a while. Eventually, they transitioned her to uh, ECMO, as you can see there. She came out with an open chest. They did natural septostomy to, to vent the LV. And um, over the next few days, uh, she improved slightly, but really marginally. She was transitioned to peripheral ECMO. She was on CRT, uh, but unfortunately, her right heart, her LV actually improved, went from about 20, 25 to about 40, 45, but her RV uh, continued to be a problem, as is often the case in these patients, and they couldn't wean her from ECMO, and that's when the, uh, the heart failure and the surgeon actually came to me um, and said, uh, the patient continues to have severe TR, refractory right heart failure. Uh, yeah. They come on, or try to come on bypass and have a boatload of TR? No, I, and I should have mentioned that because I wrote intraoperative T, but really that was a post-op. No, her TR looked much better in the OR. It was supposedly mild, um, and then, uh, but over the ensuing days, she just struggled. Maybe the RV got a little bit worse, and then I think just things dilated, and then the TR became more of a problem. They didn't think she was a candidate to take her back for another operation. Um, she wasn't going to qualify for any of our existing. We have all of the protocols for T-tier. Uh, both uh, triluminate class, we've got Trisend, obviously she wasn't going to qualify for any of those, and I didn't think she had enough time, based on some other recent experiences, as I mentioned, uh, to go through a compassionate use uh, pursuit in that regard. So they asked if we thought that it was reasonable to consider doing a tricuspid valve and ring uh, using a balloon expandable. Um, I'll just go back a couple. So I wrote here intraoperative, that was incorrect. This was really her postoperative several, this was about, I think, six days later. You can see the repair with the ring. You can see she's got a ton of TR, and the RV is not looking too hot. So we, uh, we did make the decision, ultimately, to offer her um, uh, a sapien uh, in the tricuspid position. You know, the ring, you know, I won't get into all the details of, of which rings are favorable, unfavorable, but it was a 28 physio. 
Uh, it was an incomplete ring, as you can see there, uh, to the right of the TE probe, so it's not ideal. Uh, we did send it into the Edwards team, and I'm sure all of you have gotten those those total doom and gloom emails back, you know, about uh, doing this case and attending you know, from I don't know if it was Paulo or Melissa who sent us the email, but it was it was not favorable. High risk of embolization, high risk of migration, high risk of PVL, high risk of needing to do an acute PVL closure. It was it was a highly unpleasant sounding undertaking, but we really felt that she didn't have any other option. So ultimately, we agreed to move forward. Uh, I'll just mention a couple technical points. You know, one of the things I'm curious what other people's experience has been wire positioning for us. I mean, we've actually now done a handful of these, uh, both in ring and in valve. Um, you know, where to put the wire uh, can sometimes be a challenge. We've tried a few in, in dilated RVs to park it down in the RV apex, but ultimately we wind up not having enough real estate or support, and we wind up just not being able to deliver. So we've moved mostly in these cases to uh, just going in initially with a swan, putting a wire up, exchanging out for a catheter, and then parking an amplatz. I think that was probably a, an extra stiff seven centimeter floppy with the, with the curved tip, as you can see. We park it all the way out there, and it just gives us a little bit more real estate to deliver the device. As you can see, you're never gonna get really coaxial in these tricuspid cases, so it's always gonna look a little bit off-putting in terms of your positioning within the ring itself. Um, you know, and we do all the usual maneuvers. I really tend to take out all of the, any flex uh, practically with any balloon expandable case, no matter what position I'm in. I've kind of gone to a, uh, a strategy of just trying to neutralize all of, the, all of the tensions in the catheter, so I tend to take out all the flex, maybe sometimes do a little counterclockwise rotation to see if we could somehow uh, get this a little bit more coaxial, but it really just wasn't gonna happen. And you can see here we had Alana there giving us uh, you know, our amazing echo images and just kind of trying to help show us in terms of our positioning within the device. Valve deployment, you know, really, so this was, as I said, we couldn't achieve true coaxiality, but this is where we were. But the keys here, super, super, super slow inflation. You can see that there's ample opportunity, which I was an operator one position, so I'm, you know, pushing, I'm pulling, but the, the goal here is obviously just to make sure you don't miss on that lower side, you know, but you could see here it was gonna be quite asymmetric, so I just wanted to be as, as, as ventricular as we could on that lower side without missing and not potentially embolizing. You don't have to pace for these procedures is what, what I've been told. We had the luxury here of still having her, her operative cardiac uh, pacing wires, so we actually did some controlled pacing at about 120. Uh, you can see here, and obviously you can see she's still on ECMO, which really didn't get in our way. There were some discussions of how that was gonna interfere, but it didn't at all. You could just see two nice views of a very stable device. You can also see she had a balloon pump, which came out. Here's our post, post imaging. Really nicely seated device. You can see the glass on the right, which Alana's a big fan of, just showing uh, how, how good everything looks. So while off-label tricuspid valve and valve and valve and ring may be a consideration in patients who have severe TR right heart failure but are deemed prohibitive risk for surgery, in this case it was a re-op surgery, as always planning is key. Uh, I didn't get into all the details, but you know, of course we did the usual CT, which I don't know how much help a CT is even in these patients. We know the size of the ring. We're not worried about obstructing anything like in a mitral, but we got a CT anyway because that's what the Edwards Advanced Imaging and Proctor team had recommended, but it didn't really change our strategy. Obviously the type and size of the ring is critical in terms of success. In this case it was an impartial, but we had absolutely no PVL. Uh, I forgot to mention we added three CCs to the 29 prep wire selection and positioning we talked about, and uh, critically important to have good intraoperative imaging for positioning and deployment, and slow deployment without rapid pacing is feasible. Thanks. What happened to the patient? Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> She's dead. No. Um, she, actually, she actually did incredibly well. So she, she weaned off of ECMO uh, about six days later. Uh, balloon pump came out three days later, ECMO came out. Uh, ultimately, actually one thing I forgot to mention is that ultimately they called this back because she was still struggling a little bit but markedly improved and then they thought that there was, it was really bi-directional but there was a little bit of bi-directional uh, flow through the septostomy that had been created in the OR. So actually I went back in I think like nine days after the TVIR and I closed the septum. Um, and then actually after that, she really, really did fly. Um, ultimately, it was like a 65-day hospitalization from the time of that original surgery. But she left the hospital. We saw her back in clinic now twice since, including about two weeks ago. And, and she's really, honestly, thriving. George, can I ask a question? So she was on ECMO since the operation? Yes. And her chest was open? 
chest was open, but then she was brought back a few days later and her chest was closed and she was converted to peripheral ECMO, yes. I mean, the, if the patient on ECMO is on bypass and basically it would take you 20 minutes on a beating heart to sew another valve, is that considered? I mean, so open the chest, you're on ECMO, you just leave on ECMO, you make a little hole, so uh, it is. I, I, you know, I wasn't part of... I, really when they had come to me, they had basically said, we really think if we can avoid uh, going back in and doing a TVR, that that would be best, and, and that was how I got involved, so. You know, Bruce, this is this is a fantastic case. I mean, it's a, and uh, you know, you talked about those uh, turn down that you get. I mean, I, t I tell you those failed ring, failed tricuspid ring. You know, they you get that message from Triclip, you get it from CLASP, you get it from Evoke, you get it from TTVR. You know, what do we, what, what do you think we should do with those? I mean, you know, not yours, Steve, yours never fail, but like some tricuspid, <laughs> some tricuspid rings, you know, a lot of them fail and they, they come in with a C shape and they're like standing in the middle of the tricuspid, you know, analyst. You had a wonderful demonstration about how you can put a, a, a sapien valve in there. But like some of them are bigger, like they, yeah. you know, they're, they're bigger than sapien and they will not, qualify for, you know, for obvious reason. I mean, you see that ring in the middle of the tricuspid valve. What do you think that, uh, you know, the strategy for those would be? Yeah, so we, you know, we did talk about through all the options, you know, I didn't even get into the details of that. We didn't feel that she was an edge-to-edge -edge repair uh, candidate because actually if you saw there was a sizable coaptation gap. We don't have access to intrepid uh, in the tricuspid position. So usually when I have those cases, I'll call around or usually I'll call Sushil and see what's going on up, uh, you know, uptown and see what, what options they have. Um, fortunately for this one, you know, we felt that the sapien was gonna work, but. I was aiming, if, I don't know what's. You were aiming just to land it, I, get I was the aiming, stick, yeah. I was aiming to basically be as ventricular as I could, but making right. sure that I didn't miss because yeah. you saw how asymmetric it was. So on that lower side, you know, I just wanted to make sure that I didn't wind up basically completely missing on the atrial <laughs> side, and that's why I was doing the push-pull. I did a lot of maneuvers before we inflated, as I mentioned, to see if I could achieve better coaxiality, flex, unflex, you know, clock, counterclock. I just couldn't do anything uh, you know, to get it better. I was wondering if I should switch wire. I, by the way, I forgot to mention that, you know, once you obviously cross, you're gonna take that, you're not gonna deploy with that wire in the in the pulmonary, <laughs> you know, up, up uh, top there. So you're gonna take the wire back and then try and drop it down into the RV apex, which sometimes has his own uh, challenges to reposition. But yeah. I, I couldn't get it to be like a 50. Yeah, but we, we don't worry about it being coaxial for the, yeah. the tricuspid side. And we tend to put it in, as opposed to trying to do this on the mitral side where you don't wanna get it stuck out in the LVOT. That's not particularly worry. So we, we tend to push it down a little bit lower into the RV. Yeah, you know, and, guys. and I've changed, you know, you talked about the depth of positioning. I've changed a little bit over time for, for at least for mitrals. I really try and go almost like inflow to inflow. Like I've stopped going 80, 20 on the atrial side. I don't, I think we were implanting some of our mitrals a little bit too atrial. Uh, you know, there's this whole concept of, you know, the skirt and catching things. I've actually tried to go more ventricular, at least in the valves, when you know that you've got the comfort of the frame of the valve. Obviously, we don't have that with the ring, so I was super afraid if I didn't have enough purchase on the ring on the atrial side, you know, that I would risk embolization. Um, so that's, you know, I, would I love an 80-20? Probably in a ring, yes, but, uh, you know, in this case, we had to just catch what we could. Um, I, you know, so in terms of the coaxiality, some people say putting the wire in the left side versus the right side makes a difference but you had brought the wire back in the RV during the deployment, so I don't know if that would, would have changed things, but I don't You're saying deploying with it in the left? Yeah, with the wire in the left. Interesting. I always bring it back long. and try and drop it into the RV. So you're saying you don't always drop it into right. the RV? Yeah, so some people say that. I, I don't know, if, honestly, I don't understand the anatomical explanation for that, but so sometimes getting the wire into the left instead of the right lung. Then the other thing um, that I was gonna ask you about was the amount of extra volume you put in there. So, so the risk in these tricuspid valve and rings is because it's incomplete is PVL. Yep, yep. And, uh, and I had a case, I think it was actually the same ring that you had, I think it was a 28. And we put uh, an extra, just an extra couple CCs yep. to make sure it would stay. And right where the ring wasn't present, I had terrible PVL. And so I wanna ask Steve and any other surgeons, you know, if we overexpand these incomplete rings, what does that do anatomically to that gap? And, I, and that's exactly where it just came off. And we had torrential PVL uh, right where the ring was incomplete. 
So we tend not to overinflate them. You know, we use nominal, not to overinflate them for that exact reason. You yeah. think what you're doing is squishing against there, but what you're really probably doing is yeah. opening. Yeah, That's exactly, exactly right. Opening that ring up. And you, I think you make your PVL worse by that. I know you're trying to treat the PVL, right. but I think you flare it at the end by the AV node. So that's why I was, I was impressed that you got this result with an extra three CCs because I would have said inflate it nominal. I, so we added yeah. the, the, the volume, but we also talked about the fact that it did not need to be, you know, we didn't do a pressure inflation. This ring, though, is we pretty sp stiff. We spoke to operator, too, and yeah. I said, you don't have to go nuts giving it your all, you know, and, and we did talk about if you, you know, if we deform it, that could be a problem. I just was worried that at nominal, I just wasn't sure if it was going to be enough to, to, you know, to anchor. That was okay. my concern. But I mean, in the end of the day, I think sometimes you just, it's a matter of getting lucky, and you know, they say better lucky better than Better lucky right. than good. Yeah, I think that's sometimes part of these cases. The other question was related to this patient's post-operative RV dysfunction. Um, did you, at some point, shoot the cores and graphs um, post-op? And you know, no. you, what? Why? The question is, why did the RV fail? You know, is it a, a cardioplegia issue? I mean, we we have I have seen a case where you know patient had RCA disease, and there was a you know RCA graft placed, and then the graft was down, and the, the native vessel had occluded, so they had a big RV infarct. Um, you know. So we, we did talk about that as well. The only reason we didn't reshoot the cores is because the EF, as I said, went from about 20 to 45, and it was sustained there. So I didn't suspect that it was a new ischemic insult. I really think it was just long, long pump run, you know, whatever it was, bad RV to begin with, bad RV after. I mean, a bad RV is just bad. It just, I mean, if you have any thoughts as to what might have happened, why the RV yeah, didn't it's recover. It's interesting that when somebody LD comes to me with an infarct and severe TR, uh, first of all, they only did three graphs, right? Four. Four graphs. So the pump run shouldn't have been that long. But then the, I think you have to have an index of suspicion that they have hurt their RV and they won't tolerate TR. This is somebody, we don't replace too many TR, tricuspids de novo. This is probably somebody I would have. Thanks so much. So, so I mean, we, we have a few moments, but I want to ask the panel, like, the, the broader question is, is what are we going to do? What do we need? I mean, clearly right now, all TTVR devices for those rings are not going to, uh, you're not going to get in the trial. And I'm not sure, actually, it works. Like some of them, like the, the, the C3 ring is, is, is rigid, and if it detaches in the middle of the valve, they're not going to be an intrepid because you're going to leak around it. It's not going to be evoked because you're not going to be able to, you know, to expand it. You know, what, what is the solution going to be for the, uh, you know, for the failed ring? Uh, is it going to be tier similar to, uh, you know, what we tried to do for some of those mitral? Is it going to be an, a novel uh, TTVR device that we haven't discussed yet? What do you, what do you think? I think for tier, it's it's complex because we, it depends on the failure mode. You know, if it's relatively acute, you know, and the gaps aren't big, I think it's one thing. But if it's recurrent TR later on and it's related to subalveolar uh, scarring uh, and others, it's 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 different. Or a pacemaker lead that's been put in, you know. And so so I, I think it depends on the failure mode. I think we had a tricuspid tier case that we did post surgical. And the subvalvular apparatus was totally tacked down. It, it had scarred down years afterwards, and I, I, I'm sure Steve can explain it better than me, but it, the leaflets are just being held down. The gaps were just two millimeters. I mean, these are the smallest gaps on Earth. You would think this is a layup, and it was a single coaptation plane, but despite that, we, had, we took hours to get the device to pick up the, uh, pick up the leaflets. I don't know if anybody, anybody else has had that experience. Anita, you've had commercial experience with triclip, I mean, post-surgery? So we have, and, and to your point, I mean, the challenges are multiple, right? But first of all, you have the, the ring in there and then you have shadowing and you don't see well. And then you see often what you see with the posterior leaflet on the mitral, that septal leaflet is just kind of down and, and it's really hard to grab. We've tried valve and rings for those patients and we've been really discouraged because we get that paravalvular leak it's not optimal. So I agree with you. I don't know what the solution is. And nothing that I've seen that's out there seems to be optimal for these kinds of patients. I think uh, we're time. Any, any other question from the audience? Well, thank you all for... Oh.
Thank you very much. A great session. Uh, I work at University of Texas at San Antonio. We have a very robust uh, transplant program, renal and liver transplant. And we always see these patients with torrential TR. We get asked to do something about them. We have done, done some off-label tricuspid clip. The big question we have, do you expect the TR to get better just after transplant? Should we just clear them to go for transplant? Or should we address their TR before? Paul, you want to take that? <laughs> I would expect their TR to get a lot better after a heart transplant, but no. <laughs> Maybe not other organs. Yes. Um, well, I mean, we do, we, you know, we're, we're, you're talking about bridge to, you know, transplant, and, and we did see a case of that uh, here. Um, I mean, the question I think is we, we can do all this stuff casually and at certain centers, you know, at what point is there enough volume to put together a registry? We need data. We need data. Ultimately, you would need some type of labeling or indication, you know, but you mean even for mitral clip, which has been, you know, on the mitral valve, doing, right, doing a patient with an EF less than 25 percent who's, you know, in the hospital, inotropes, that's off-label, right? We're still doing that off-label now, you know, 20 years into the experience. So I think it's it's something we can do, and, and you should do it if you think it's right for the patient, but it's, it's going to be, I think, a long time before we have, like, you know, a, a, an indication for that. If you refer to the mitral literature, and, <laughs> you know, it used to be a thought in surgery of, gosh, if you fix the mitral, the tricuspid, of course, will get all better. And if you look at a meta-analysis of all the patients, it's you're betting against your patient about 60% against it. And the problem is that that ring, I mean, the annulus, once it's overstretched, becomes like a broken rubber band. It's not going to come back down again. So if you think you're going to do a kidney transplant on the patient and change their volume and they're going to get all better and so on like that, that tricuspid is probably cooked at that point in time. If they have severe or massive or tsunami or whatever we call it now, that annulus is overstretched and it's not going to miraculously come back down no matter what you do. You know, I, one of the things that really struck me the most from this meeting was seeing actually Jao Cavalcante's presentation on the, the three-dimensional, you know, MRI and CT imaging of the right ventricle. I mean, he said, you know, over 80% of the patients in Triluminate could not have adequate assessment of RV function because they just couldn't see the RV. And that's, that's the missing picture here in, in all of these cases is what, what is the underlying RV function in the patients we're treating and how does that help us stratify? I mean, Craig Miller always said, you know, it's the ventricle dummy about, you know, secondary MR, right? It's not the mitral valve, it's the ventricle that's the problem. Same thing here, it's the ventricle. Uh, so I think we also need to, to develop better methods of assessing RV function because I think that's going to be the key to really decide which of these patients get better and, and what, who doesn't. I mean, the other, the other possibility that I see this strategy be helpful in trying to, trying to understand the, uh, the liver disease and the kidney disease that those patients often have. Um, very often they get labeled as liver cirrhosis and kidney disease and, you know, that take them off the, uh, you know, the, the transplant list. And, you know, many of them we've seen the, you know, the liver is just congestive hepatopathy from the TR and it gets better after, you know, after fixing the TR. So I don't think we're, we're ready to talk about it for, you know, TR as a bridge to transplant, but I, uh, but I can see how we can get there uh, very quickly in the, in the future. I've had a, a few patients on the liver transplant list who somebody decided, well, let's get a right heart cath and just look at things a little bit further, and it turns out it's all cardiac. And so, uh, and, and, and we got them off the list because we took care of their cardiac issues, so. Well, thank you all for being with us this morning and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Start up again in a half hour, more cases. <laughs>